uh, organization like uh, the formal and informal organization and uh, subsequently we'll also have a uh, sound understanding about the typologies that uh, um, like for uh, like sorry uh, the line agency staff agency and how actually they are uh, been also found to be overlapped with uh, the formal and informal organization okay and subsequently we'll also discuss about uh, administrative theory uh, its uh, evolution the growth of administrative theory so uh, as per your uh, curriculum uh, content is concerned what i get to know that uh, your um, the entire uh, uh, syllabus of your master's program uh, in this semester is covering the 20 units in administrative theory so that's why here i just want to make a point over here that while we are discussing the administrative theory that uh, we must have a comprehensive understanding about the context under which theorization has been done okay so here uh, we will only focus on uh, the prominent uh, questions like whether administrative theory has its own independent base or not okay and subsequently we'll go for elaborately discussing the scientific management theory uh, then administrative management theory and uh, um, new public administration new public management so all these things we will discuss so let me begin with uh, just have a understanding with the um, organization as I got from your syllabus, actually, it is very few things are coming under your uh, the concept of organization. But I will suggest you to read it elaborately. Uh, it is only talking about the principles of organization. Uh, it is not talking about the typologies elaborately. But it, it would be better that if you go through elaborately, not only studying the principles of organization, but also by taking into account its typologies. So let me share you. So, is it uh, visible to you? Yes, ma'am. So, while we are studying public administration, so essentially, uh, we begin with uh, one of the dominant theme like organization. So here we are studying public bureaucracy or particularly bureaucracy and how bureaucracy, uh, anyone want to say something or what? Some sound is coming. So here, while we are, we want to know about what, what is public administration. So one of the way we begin our study with the concept of bureaucracy and bureaucracy is also a form of organization where we are looking forward that how this organization is functioning so so the activity a part of public administration would not be a possibility without organization so public administration requires organization but organization can take many different forms and can maximize many diverse values and uh, here the organization we could be able to assess through or locate through the structures which affects the behavior of the organization as a whole and of the individual members of it so 
similarly if we uh, take into account that how organizations are functioning so we need to focus on the process of the organization through which they are operating themselves so uh, while studying the structure of the organization we definitely look towards the design like suppose you are studying a government organization so government organization essentially uh, begins with a level of hierarchy a chart of hierarchy where there is a superior and there are also other subordinates so in that way you would be able to identify the structure of the organization and such design has been done according to the certain principles okay but essentially such designing uh, will not give you the understanding why this organization okay so why this organization means here we need to um, um, locate the purpose of the organization so every organization whenever we come across with any kind of organization like society is consisting of several types of organization like you could say that family as an organization and in family the organization itself has a purpose similarly uh, while studying about bureaucracy so every organization every bureaucratic form of organization has come up come into existence for the attainment of some purpose or goal so it is not about merely organizations are not merely about the structures they are also about that they have to achieve certain purpose so in the discipline of public administration the relationship between organization and its management has been one of the dominant themes of research for last several decades okay so merely we are not just studying the role of civil servants we are also studying that how government in the form of a ministry in the form of a department or in, in the form of various branches maybe judiciary maybe legislature or maybe executive how they are functioning so now come to the the most famous the most prominent way through which actually we, uh, we are generally reading organization by beginning with the max weber so max weber identifies three types of organization on the basis of the exercise of authority like charismatic authority traditional authority legal rational authority and max weber is one of the uh, classical philosopher who actually talked elaborately about that why authority matters in the organization and what should be its nature so such uh, kind of uh, philosophy ha uh, had emerged to keep in view the expansion of industrial society in europe so when max weber had talked about all these things he witnessed that industrialization has already been expanded in europe and the necessities of industrialization or the uh, consequence the consequence of industrialization actually leading towards creating different kinds of organization and in that process the complexities in order to meet the complex demands of the society that organization also needs to be reinvented so in that regard he had given utmost priority to the legal rational authority as the rational form of organization okay so uh, here that legal rational authority essentially needs to be manifested in the modern bureaucracy so in that way he actually while elaborating that understanding he made the distinction between charismatic authority traditional authority and legal rational authority so far as charismatic authority is concerned so here organization is essentially driven by the charisma of a person so in that form of organization what happens authority has been exercised uh, between the interaction between the leader and the follower so 
in a, uh, in an organization which is essentially uh, led by a leader where the members believe that their leader have certain charisma so that's why they need to be a leader that's why that person need to be a leader because that person is having the charisma that kind of attractiveness so here they are essentially following the leader without questioning the act of the leader so they uh, have they have a very strong conviction that leader knows everything and leader has the charisma and leader has the ability to solve everything so that's why we need to follow them uh, uh, and uh, we need to obey them obey that leader in order to fulfill the agenda of the organization so in one way charismatic authority essentially legitimized himself or herself through the personal charisma which is essentially not a mass phenomenon okay so in charismatic form or the organization which essentially driven by with the charismatic authority direction so they are actually the members or the people who are part of that organization they are somehow um, hypnotized or you could say that um, been uh, fascinated by the persons the leaders charisma so like you could say that even in the present form of organization also we do believe though the organizations are essentially a product of legalities in contemporary times but still we also search for the charisma uh, in case of our, our leaders so while we are saying okay that person is our leader so he is the prime minister he is the chief minister so automatically uh, an impression automatically an assumption uh, looms over our head okay the leader must be our charismatic person so in that way actually charisma as a phenomenon still persisting in a legal rational form of authority now comes to the traditional authority so traditional authority are found to be those organization or you could say that it was it continued to prevail in those type of organizations where there is some oh, sort of hereditary institution to rule okay so here the authority is being determined on the basis of hereditary on the basis of kinship clan so here actually the person's social status or the um, strata to which uh, that person had born so on that basis uh, that person possess the ownership to rule over the or exercise authority over the concerned organization or society as a whole in traditional authority essentially we have to consider the presence of king queen or somebody dynasty rule so these kinds of patterns are coming under the traditional authority where actually society views those kinds of authorities the beginning of like where that some dynasty they continues to rule for a longer period of time and in that uh, process the institution of kingship has emerged and uh, also that uh, in uh, um, there is also understanding prevails that kings are the representative of god so that's why they need to obey the king so traditional authorities are generally legitimized themselves in the society through their connectivity to to the uh, supernatural power particularly to the god and also having the ability to rule over the society but while come coming to the legal rational authority here we are believing that the organizations have been created out of the process of legality that organizations they can't be created in vacuum they are to be created through a proper legal procedure and 
this legal procedure also determines that what would be the base of basis of its authority so the legal rational authority actually considered to be the rational authority because it here the individual who is holding that authority his position in that organization has not been determined on the basis of charisma or on the basis of any kind of his association with any dynasty or any kind of hereditary institution so his association or his presence in the concerned organization has been determined on the principle of merit okay so here as he or she has a desired level of qualification and that person has come through the competitive examination so that's why that person is been um, um selected uh with the understanding that he or she could be able to run the organization on the basis of law so here the the uh, exercise of authority is not on the basis of any kind of personal uh, association or any kind of social association like in case of traditional authority that uh, the king needs to be obeyed uh, uh, or the uh, the subjects they need to follow the king uh, because uh, the king and uh, his family continues to rule in the uh, concerned uh, territory so that's why that person needs to be obeyed so here the obedience has been only uh, been determined that uh, on the basis of social status whereas when coming to the legal rational authority is concerned so the basis of obedience is or basis of uh, following uh, the hierarchy is on the basis of uh, that uh, legality so legal rational authority generally been considered to be the most appropriate uh, basis uh, to exercise the legitimate way uh, the exercise the authority in a legitimate way in the modern organization and in present times whatever the form of bureaucracy may be we are essentially thinking we are also believing and we are also observing that these are the product of legal rational authority so here a superior essentially not a direct a uh, his or her subordinate on the basis of the personal ground rather impersonality prevails to be the dominant uh, feature of the legal rational authority so here person doesn't matter in legal rational authority the persons are there the human beings are there and they have come through a merit based selection process to that organization but they cannot exercise their authority on the basis of their emotions or their personal affinity so they have to exercise authority on the basis of impersonality and this impersonality he has to be guided by the legal action so whatever law is saying accordingly the senior the superior needs to follow and also needs to uh, generate command from the subordinate on the basis of law so if law is not asking that in that way uh, the subordinate needs to be obeyed then automatically the subordinates uh, then sorry the, uh, the subordinate there is no proper rationality to obey that so um so these are all about the kinds of authorities which actually been discussed in the context of organization and we dominantly uh, um, understand that uh, this legal rational authority found to be prevalent but there are also critical understanding towards that how legal rational authority is also not been able to stick to the uh, attribute of impersonality rather charismatic and traditional authorities they are subsuming 
within the form of legal rational authority. Now coming over to the Luther Bully, who also identified the four bases of organization, which are popularly known as four P's like purpose, process, persons, and place. So while, as I told you that uh, organization is not merely about the structures, so organization are also needs to be studied on the ground that why they are being formed. So while we are trying to get the answer why they are being formed, so we need to search, we need to locate the agenda, the purpose for which they are being created. So Luther Gulick essentially views organization through four bases and uh, uh, the or concerned organization must have a purpose so that this purpose will provide the direction the concerned organization to function itself so organization can be created in a vacuum so it must have a purpose and this purpose will subsequently provide the pathways that um, to uh, uh, that how that organization will function then process so process here means that every no doubt who the organization has already mentioned that what is its objective okay so accordingly it has to act but how that act has to begin okay how that function has to perform so it is all about the process of that organization so so it essentially uh, determine the communication channel in the organization so in that communication channel that how actually the activities of the organizations has been undertaken and whether that activity is essentially fulfilling the purpose of the organization is also a very crucial task to determine so process and purpose they are actually interrelated very closely they are very closely proximate to each other because that the functional purpose of the organization needs to be reflected in the activities or process of the organization so superior and the subordinate or the different layers of the uh, human uh, resources may exist in the organization but the purpose of the, their existence essentially been legitimized uh, through the channel of communication how they are communicating with each other and in that communication how they are actually uh, communicating the essential purpose of the organization is uh, uh, the basis of the concerned organization then coming to the persons or the clientele you could say the presently we are now using the word clientele so every organization has its own clientele clientele base so uh, definitely we are saying that organization can't run without human beings because they are the critical agents who need to deliver the purpose of the organization but whom they have to deliver so here actually we are talking about those persons who are essentially not the member of the organization but receives service from the organization so they are the clientele so in order to keep in view the clientele the needs of the clientele organizations are essentially being created so like you could say that uh, uh, um, suppose we'll take uh, any form of organization let's like take uh, take the case of a department so while we are uh, saying there is a department uh, department of uh, um, uh, you could say um, uh, the water resources so why why the particular department so why actually government uh, um, thought about to create such kind of department so there is a so here we need to look towards the history and also like you may come across with the emergence of new department in recent times like in odisha you take the case of the mission sakti department so in that so this is a new department so earlier mission sakti as a 
program it was been with a part of the wcd department of government of odisha but why subsequently it has become a separate department so here such uh, incident uh, actually uh, attract our attention towards that the clientele how actually clientele has become the dominant uh, um, basis to formulate organization and if you also observe the restructuring of the organization in recent times like uh, uh, at the um, uh, central level or at, at the state level you would be able to know that how actually clientele has become the main basis to formulate uh, or to integrate new form of organization in the shape of department then now coming to the place of course the concern uh, organization needs to run okay so uh, so while running that while observing the uh, functional aspect of that organization that uh, organization must need a physical space so here no doubt now we are saying that we are now living in the in the era of uh, uh, post globalization where actually we are now having uh, we are introducing the pattern to uh, like uh, work from home uh, but still organization do uh, they do need certain locations certain physical space to designate itself okay it is the headquarter okay these are the field offices okay so the, these things uh, are still there so no, no doubt luther gulick has provided the four bases of organization uh, while such kind of imagination relating to the virtual presence of the organization has come up but um, still it matters okay then these are some of the definitions relating to organization that how we could be able to define an organization and generally the most referred one is being followed in uh, uh, by the scholars the chester banner's uh, definition that an organization as a system of consciously coordinated personal activities or forces of two or more persons so it is basically a collective activity and this collective activity needs to be coordinated uh, among the persons who are engaged in that organization so uh, so also that uh, uh, you could say that uh, co uh, in bernard's thinking coordination continues to be the central principle of organization like various scholars they have offered that um, how organization needs to be run so in that regard they provided the proposition that in order to understand that how organizations are functioning how organizations are running so we need to study them by uh, uh, initiating our inquiry from different kinds of principles so while reading chester bernard uh, being a, being an administrative thinker so you definitely would be uh, come across with the concept of coordination where um, the coordination is being viewed as very much central to make the organization functional because coordination not only achieve the purpose of the organization coordination also uh, create a sense of bonding among the persons who are working in that organization so so chester banner had also been viewed uh, the um, uh, has viewed the, the positive relationship between an informal sorry a, a, a formal and an informal organization that we will discuss later but it is a system of uh, coordination where and this coordination uh, is created deliberately or consciously okay. then uh, so far as victor thompson's uh, uh, definition is concerned that it is a highly rationalized and impersonal integration of a large 
number of specialists cooperating to achieve some announced specific objective. So I have mentioned that the modern organizations are essentially viewed as a rational entity. Okay. And it is rational. It needs to be rational because the rules needs to be followed in an impersonal manner. So and there we are uh, expecting the presence of the specialized specialist who must have the knowledge about how the organization needs to perform and also they must need to cooperate with each other because they have to achieve the desired objective of the organization and while coming to the definition of e right back that organization is a continuing system of differentiated and coordinated human activities utilizing transforming and welding together a specific set of human material capital additional and natural resources into a unique problem whole whose function is to satisfy particular human needs in interaction with other system of human activities and resources in this particular environment so these are some of the definition of course uh, relating to the marx weber's understanding about organizations uh, then uh, luther gulick's perspective of organization and bernard's perspective of organization they do matter in the study of public administration uh, because uh, we are also reading them as thinker administrative thinker and we also do follow their argument while uh, uh, conducting researches on uh, public administration and uh, uh, while coming to the words of amitai ejoni that our society is organizational society and we born in hospitals educated in schools employed by business firms or government agencies uh, so also some people they do join in trade unions professional association so here actually we are surrounded actually we are surrounded by organization provided that we need to know that what are the purposes of those organization and what is our role in that okay so uh, so, so that's why organizations are essentially just not new uh, uh, no doubt uh, with the expansion of industrial society the complexities associated with organization has been expanded but in pre industrial societies also organizations were continued to persist and they did have specific goals and you could say that family is a, a uh, one form of organization which continues to be uh, there since uh, the beginning of human society no doubt that we are now not considering family as essentially a formal organization but family as a form of organization is persisting but while we are coming to the public administration we are talking about bureaucracy as a form of organization and how actually bureaucracy is uh, uh, assigned with the specific mandate to conduct all the government act to all the act of the state so that that's why we need to focus on the role of bureaucracy okay now coming to the case of um, just uh, so these are all about uh, that why organization these slides are why organization that uh, uh, the pers the presence of personnel uh, and also facilitation relating to the accomplishment of uh, the goals uh, then also the efforts and capacities of individuals and groups engaged in a common task in a coordinated way to secure the desired objective uh, so these are about that this is also about uh, that um, as i told you that organization is the planned coordination of the activities of a number of persons or employees for the uh, accomplishment of some common explicit purpose or goal through division of labor 
and functions and through hierarchy of authority and responsibility. So I have also mentioned the hierarchy of authority and responsibility. We just did have a little discussion about it uh, while discussing the rational legal authority. So uh, in uh, rational, in uh, the modern form of organization where we uh, who, who thought that uh, the organization uh, need to run by the rational legal authority and uh, here the hierarchy is been determined as per this legal authority um, and impersonal order and of course without having a cooperative and systematic relationship between the, them the results definitely would be disappointing uh, and as we uh, suppose while we are trying to um, analyze the efficiency of an organization like take the organization like DRC, ITDA. So suppose uh, uh, you are you are interested to write a note on a paper on that organization. So definitely you need to begin with the um, that how that organization, the purpose of the organization uh, has been achieved. So while uh, centering on that question, so you will initiate with the structure of the organization, then how actually it is functioning, and whether there is essentially a coordination among them, whether coordination matters in bringing positive relation uh, in achieving the objective of that organization or not. So you may uh, go through this kind of analysis. So finally, James J. Muni rightly observes that an organization is necessary Whenever two or more people must combine their efforts towards the same end. So here we are getting one thing that in most of the definition, the coordination continues to be uh, prevent, maybe in an explicit form or maybe in an implicit form. So uh, this is all about then this is principle i have not filled up this uh, slide the principles of organization like uh, uh, if you read about the principles of organization most of the textbooks on public administration they do generally begin with uh, or having a separate chapter on principles of public administration so in the last class also i had mentioned uh, something about it so here i want to tell you that uh why why we want to understand an organization so um it is generally uh, assumed that uh, or you could say that uh, um, uh, it is also one of the paradigms okay uh, it is principle studying principles of organization is one of the paradigms of the public administration here actually if you read the, the article uh, by writings of nicholas henry so nicholas henry actually talked about the different the five paradigms of public administration so paradigms generally uh, the, the pathways uh, how to understand a particular discipline so in order to understand public administration as a discipline so nicholas henry has uh, had mentioned about that how actually principles of public administration or studying principles of public administration one would be able to understand how organization is been run so henry file if we consider the case of henry file so henry file uh, as an administrative thinker he has provided 14 principles that uh, where that uh, he is talking extensively about that organizations would be understood through those 14 principles so that they are you could you can study uh, you could study it from the angle of authority and responsibility from the centralization from the unity of command from the also the hierarchy and also that uh, supervision so all these principles one may take into account while initiating the study on organization okay so now 
uh, we'll have elaborative discussion about the principles of organization in while discussing about the uh, on the evolution of administrative theory. So while coming to the formal organization, as I told you in the last class, that we may classify organization as formal and informal. So in that, but in your content, it is not elaborately been mentioned, but I uh, suggest advise you to read it. So formal organization is one which is deliberately planned and designed and duly sanctioned by the competent authority. It is the organization as shown on the organization chart or as described by manuals or rules. Okay, so uh, any form of formal organization essentially is being deliberately planned. Okay, so it cannot just uh, created out of any uh, without um, uh, kind of you could say that uh, just uh, um, uh, like uh, if there is no necessity, so that with, uh, it is just. Uh, not come out of any kind of informal uh, way. Okay? So it is uh, planned by the government. So government is planned. Government necessarily uh, make a stock taking analysis that whether uh, any scope um, any scope for uh, bringing a new form of organization is required. So in that, that it becomes a legal organization. And here, uh, the creation of this organization needs to be or sanctioned by the competent authority. And uh, formal organizations are essentially appear to the observer from the outside because it has a clear cut market structure, physical space. And it is possible for the organization to prepare a chart forming the structure. So if you visit any office, if you visit uh, any government offices, or you could say any private office also, that uh, uh, there you would be able to get uh, the sense that um, you would be able to observe that the purpose of the organization or the hierarchy of that organization is completely, uh, generally completely shown in the wall of that physical space. So, so as an outsider, suppose uh, being an outsider, I am visiting to the any formal organization, maybe a school, maybe a department, maybe a hospital. So there, while I am entering into that, so he, there we are uh, observing that certain kinds of uh, um, uh, structure uh, we need to counter like there must be a desk there must be the, in the world there must be uh, the purpose of that concern the motto of that organization needs to be uh, available in an elaborative manner and also that the persons the uh, uh, the uh, the people who are working that organization or who are the authorities of that organization, their names, their designations also found to be available in the chat. So, uh, according to Chester Bannard, formal organization is a system of consciously coordinated activities or forces of two or more persons. So, Bernard explains that individuals agree to work in an organization because, because they are prepared to contribute their services and receive in return certain kinds of benefits. So here the purpose of formal organization is very much clear that one way it is it depends on the coordinated activities of more than two persons and also the individuals who have agreed to work over there <coughs> they are contributing their services in exchange of certain benefits like uh, in exchange of uh, that they are getting certain kinds of uh, remuneration or monetary benefit or also satisfaction so that's why the, they are being worked over there so this kind of thing found to be prevailing formal organization and so far as the 
distinct characteristics of formal organizations are concerned as i told you also <coughs> that uh, it uh, that formal organization definitely have a legal status okay it must be crowd, uh, created out of the law okay then there must be <coughs> properly division of work so who needs to decide who needs to work what so in the basis of organization we study that the organization has certain uh, purpose certain process so in order to carry out the process and purpose of the organization the division of work needs to be done and this division of work uh, enable to actualize uh, the purpose and the uh, process of the organization and it is also essential so that none of the uh, persons who are working in the concerned organization will be overburdened so any single person can do everything so that's why the division of work needs to be done in order to give specific tasks to particular individuals so that they would be able to complete the concerned tasks in time and also division of work uh, fixes a clear accountability that for which work the particular person uh, is accountable before the superior so in that regard also division of work creates a stability or also brings certain level of stability uh, functionality in the organization then there must be the primacy of structure so that we have already discussed that a structure must be there maybe in terms of physical and also in terms of the organizational structure or hierarchical structure must be there okay then permanence so here that the formal organization essentially they uh, need to be sustained in a permanent way that we are saying that okay uh, this uh, department is existing this uh, 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 office is existing it is a kind of uh, arrangement has been made on the basis of permanency of course that this permanence itself also subject to change um, that uh, but still we do think that uh, while we want to watch uh government activities in certain term definitely it needs to be facilitated through a structured organization then there must be rules and regulations of course besides rules and regulations any form of organization would not be uh, be able to functional because if there would be an absence of rules and regulation regulations then what will happen then uh, nobody would be clear about that what is his or her role so in that circumstances if the person concern is not clear about the role the responsibilities and how that role and responsibilities needs to be performed then automatically chaotic situation will arise in the concerned organization so any form of formal organization is an effective organization where the rule clearly the rules clearly elaborate that what kind of activities to be the members and for that they are also needs to be in exchange of that ma'am ma would you please repeat permanence i didn't understand permanence, permanence. <clears throat> okay let me finish the rules and regulations okay so besides okay. the rules and regulations that there would be a chaotic condition in the uh, organization and it may also create conflict among the members that um, uh, in uh, confusion that who is uh, bound to do what okay while coming to permanence permanence means that we are thinking about the existence of the concerned office permanently so when while we are saying the office is being created like take the case of collector's office okay so while we are saying there is the district collector 
so district collector is not merely about the designation it is also about the structure of administration in the district so here anybody may be a district collector any person the, the concerned person may change the, 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 the concerned person is subject to change regularly as per the tenure but so far as the existence of the office is concerned it is permanent in nature so it is not essentially not going to be replaced okay so while we are saying there is a pmo office while saying that there is a secretariat or any uh, such kind of structure we are uh, countering so persons in persons who are working in that organization definitely they are subject to change as per their tenure in the that job but so far as the structure of that office is concerned that office continues to be there so formal organizations are essentially continue to be permanent in nature so they are replacement essentially not done on the basis of the uh, uh, change of the particular individual are you okay then is it okay or you need some more elaboration yes ma'am <laughs> about the in, uh, informal organization so um, the necessity of informal organization arises because formal organizations essentially not offer the scope to satisfy all the needs of individual members so it is expected that while human being working in a formal organization is not allowed to exchange his emotions or her emotions or a uh, personal opinion so as that person needs to undertake uh, the activities relating to the work in a very professional manner and also to be abided by the rules and regulations so that's why many times what happens formal organizations is not uh, facilitate the emotional needs of the individuals okay. so here uh we may call our uh, fellow members as colleagues but as colleagues essentially uh, we also do need to behave in a professional manner so that's why the members they try to seek satisfaction of their needs from the other sources so this is the result of the formation of informal organization if you read the textbook of public administration like starting from the ld white then chester banard you would be able to get understand uh, get the understanding that how actually particularly ld white and chester banard they talked elaborately about the presence of formal and informal organization simultaneously okay no, no doubt uh, in uh, an office structure that uh, formally we need to behave but also uh you uh, if you will observe that many people also they become good friends while working in that uh, organization so here the presence of formal organization may be very much appears to be structural but so far as presence of informal organization essentially not structural so structure uh, or non availability of structure it essentially it doesn't matter for the presence of informal organization uh, like chester banner has noted individual derives personal comfort in social relations which is called solidarity social integration or social security so through social contact individual satisfies a need for identification and belonging so informal organizations provide greater opportunities for the individuals to prove their capabilities which the formal organization cannot provide suppose you take the example some people some new people have joined in an office and they are definitely there are also the old people working over there so uh, the, um, there are so many anecdotes about it that uh, how actually the old generation is not ready to accept the new generation and also the new generation also thinks 
that okay they are something superior they are having something advanced knowledge in comparison to the old generation so it also create a certain level of uh, lack of trust between those two generations working in the concerned organization but while coming to the formal structure of the office that definitely the subordinate one needs to uh, obey the orders of the superior and if the superior is the younger one then automatically the subordinate uh, also feels uh, uh, because of his age or her age may feel that okay that she um, is in a better position because having uh, uh, good qualification or coming through the merit so um, um so a kind of uh, non acceptance environment may come up but legal rational structure of organization essentially not allowing us to behave in such a manner because here uh, we need to behave in a uh, uh, as per the rules so as per so rule is suggesting over here to become professional so here that if any grievances is occurring at the uh, individual level so where need to be ventilated so it actually led towards the creation of informal organization so strict hierarchy in a formal organization also creates concern relating to cooperation among the individual so if the individuals who are working in the concerned organization if they uh, somehow been uh, relatively flexible with relate uh, with regard to their own designation and seek cooperation from each other uh, on the basis of as the as they are human and they are they need to attain certain goals and also they need each other's limitations then in that regard informal you may find the presence of informal organization and in that process also informal organization an enabling factor towards uh, making individual more competent or more capable which essentially formal organization essentially do not provide then every individual experiences tensions frustrations in the organizations while uh, performing their job essentially not been overcome in the formal organization and to overcome this then understanding suppose you want to go on a leave suppose um, uh, but uh, here your boss is not ready to give you leave your boss is not ready to understand your situation so as per the so here also creates a kind of conflict between the superior and the subordinate and here um, um, the if the boss is not ready to learn the genuine necessity of the leave of the subordinate then automatically it will create an environment of conflict so um, so here the communication between the superior and the subordinate and of course the communication among the colleagues okay also very much important that whether they are while making conversation while acting together they are driven by with the attitude of compassion or understanding or not okay so like take the example of suppose somebody want to go on a maternity leave somebody is approaching towards her maternity leave so in that condition how organization is supposed to behave with her okay so uh, so while uh, she is in office so if organization will think that okay she needs to be more comfortable so that she could do her work well and her child would be be taken care of uh, well so in that condition automatically that uh, uh, um, um, impression comes that the organization is moving in a very compassionate uh, and understanding manner so they serve as release valves and in them individuals find sympathetic friends who had similar experience you also take the case of 
the people that were uh, um, um, differently able people working in the organization and the approach of organization towards them. So, so here that we need to view the organization in that way that where the level of informality must create a positive vibe in the concerned organization. Then informal organizations enable the members to get assistance in meeting their organizational objectives. As a student, you can get assistance of your fellow students, members of org. Suppose you are attending the class, so <laughs> your uh, some of your uh, friends, they had not been able to join the class. So if you will say that if that uh, friend will uh, ask you subsequently, OK, please share your notebook. So if you will not allow them, uh, if you will not say that, then automatically that means you are behaving in a more rigid and formal manner. So if you uh, will try to give the uh, opinion, you could not attend the class, so so you will suffer. Okay. So so here that that suggests that that there is no kind of informality associated uh, existing within among your friends. So informality is a kind of thing where actually the personal bonds matter okay so our uh, as for the personal relationship as as a human being as a, as a human being we need to connect with each other where uh, it will becomes our strength in the formal organization so these are all about the formal and uh, informal organization so now uh, just uh, we'll have a switch over to the uh, administrative, uh, the growth of the administrative theory. Okay, so Is it uh, visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, see, while you want to study the genesis or the evolution of administrative theory, you must keep in mind, I think, these questions would be relevant to understand that how do we need to learn about what is administrative theory. So, uh, while coming to the theory, that why theory? Why actually we need a theory to understand a discipline? Any guess? Why do we need theory? Anyone? Hmm? Anyone, any would like to answer? See, theory essentially provides us the way, the perspective through which we could be able to analyze a social phenomenon. Okay? So while we are saying that social science is dealing with the social realities, Okay, so how actually we need to understand the social reality? So there we need the theory. So theories are actually basically a systematic way to study certain knowledges, okay, certain facts. So theory actually provides us the way how to actually translate or how to actually use certain facts to create knowledge. So that's why 
while studying social science we generally begin with the theory because you may read sociology you may read political science so every subject essentially begins with a theoretical understanding and there theoretical understandings are actually provides us the normative way okay that what ought to be suppose why you were studying something so we need to begin with a very normative questions like suppose we want to study state okay so why state what what would be the character of a state so here we are essentially becoming very much normative uh, searching for the best answer that what should be the characteristics of the state okay so here theory actually provides us the way out the perspective to understand certain phenomenon through which we could be able to generate knowledge okay so if we consider this then question comes does public administration as a discipline has its independent theoretical base because public administration as a discipline generally viewed as multidisciplinary in nature so this multidisciplinarity whether actually uh, making uh, the claim of public administration to be studied as an independent discipline so that's why it is very much essential to learn that does public administration as a discipline has its independent theoretical base so it needs to be understood through that whether administration as we have already discussed about what is an administration so whether administration is a product of political process or social process or whether administration could be studied independently so we uh, study we, we already had discussion that administration is about the collective activity administration is about the collective activity for achieving certain common goods certain common purpose in a particular society so in that regard while we are saying about the public administration so it is about the government activity so in that while we are saying it is about the government activity so government the very conception of government is it about the product of a political process or social process so if we are trying to view that the government administration as a product of political process or social process so essentially public administration does not uh, have any independent theoretical base because it relies on political theory it relies on social theory in order to um, expand its disciplinary inquiry but while we are coming to the question of that whether administration could be studied independently here actually we are exploring those scholarly writings who are talking about that how public administration could be studied independently so generally we begin with in the mainstream literature what i am saying uh, whatever the texts are available till now that they are saying that public administration as a discipline is very much uh, uh, associated with uh, the initiatives by united states of america so whatever the literatures are mostly available in the mainstream domain relating to public administration and its theorization they are basically american initiative in nature okay so most of the textbooks they begin with the uh, while talking to the theories of administration they begin with the woodrow wilson's article on study of administration so woodrow wilson's article which came which got published in the year 1887 so it talked about the dichotomy it talked about uh, the separation between politics and administration okay then subsequently james goodnow's book the politics and administration 
also talked about the separation argument and with this actually the first understanding have come up that public administration could be studied independently from the political science then uh, uh, besides that it was the writings of the marx weber which uh, has also a very substantive impact in the formulation of the disciplinary inquiry because marx weber uh, talked largely about the bureaucracy and bureaucracy as a modern form of organization and in that bureaucracy essentially the public administration as an activity generally takes place so here that it provided uh, a milestone to uh, to the public administration scholar who essentially wanted to that public administration need to be recognized as an independent discipline and also needs to be studied independently in universities in the form of a department so the new department needs to come up in the nomenclature of public administration so they generally begin with the text of marx weber the writings of woodrow wilson and james goodnow so these are the scholars through which actually public administration have got some uh, support to stand as a discipline okay so prior to, prior to that question uh, may come that prior to the what actually was happening prior to those literature okay so uh, so here uh, i am not arguing that public administration studies and public administration was not earlier there of course it was there but it was essentially considered to be the part of the political science or to be the part of the political process so while uh, studying public administration uh, as an independent discipline we need to understand that what historical context actually motivates the scholars to argue for creating public administration as a separate discipline from the political science and here we need to also learn that uh, the context how american centric understanding continues to dominate in most of the literature of theories theorization relating to public administration okay so with this actually that public administration could be initially uh, studied as an independent discipline um, by making uh, its separation from the political science so if you read nicolas henry's work or writings so he talked about that public administration the theories of public administration could be analyzed through five paradigms so the first paradigm begins with the dichotomy paradigm so this dichotomy paradigm is talking about that politics and public administration needs to be separated and here administration needs to be studied independently okay so uh, like you take the question like that while we are studying modern public administration essentially we need to we cannot escape from the question the character of the state so here while we are looking towards the character of the state like suppose you take the case of india we are in a democratic state and here in this democratic state uh, uh, we are having parliamentary democracy and in that parliamentary democracy that uh, we are thinking that uh, our legislature our uh, parliament it needs to set the law so then uh, who is to implement it so in that regard we are looking towards the role of the executive so here actually in democracies 
we are getting a clear picture okay what should be the domain of uh, public administration that is the implementation of law enforcement of the law execution of public policy so similar kind of argument such kind of argument actually first been reflected in the writings of Woodrow Wilson uh, titled as study of administration so there he mentioned that administration needs to be uh, independent from the process of politics because of two grounds the first ground is that that administration the job of public administration is about the implementation of policies or enforcement of rules regulations so once rule or act is been enacted by the um, legislature so automatically it comes to the domain of the executive and here the executive is solely responsible to enforce the concern act the concern law or concern regulation or also concern public policy so there is no question for the politics over here so they must be given due independence in order to actualize the content of the law in the society then second argument wilson provided that in order to be very much effective in achieving the desired objective of the law the administration needs to be independent needs to be neutral from the political process because the politicians who have come through the process of elections particularly in a democracy they are essentially not holding uh, the power on the basis of complete majority okay so a politicians may have come to the power by winning uh, by getting enough number of votes or maximum votes in a democracy but so far as the case of minorities are concerned so far as the case of those people who have not voted for the concerned politicians so in that case the politicians may not act as the wholesome representative of the entire populations so actually what motivated Woodrow Wilson to write such argument or to develop such argument because during that time American society was continuing with severe crisis the social and also the economic crisis and at that time also uh, demand was loomed largely over the reform of the civil service system the federal civil service system in united states of america and uh, the united states of america at that time uh, was um, uh, struggling to uh, go for uh, or to have a complete merit based bureaucracy in their own state because uh, the earlier pattern was completely driven with the spoils principles so spoils principles if you read the american history that with uh, independence that uh, they have uh, established a pattern of civil service which is driven with the principle of spoils so the principles of spoils suggest that anyone who forms the government that means any party who forms the government that party has the absolute authority to select who would be the public officials in their tenure so essentially it was not focusing on the principle of merit so that's why subsequently that uh, uh, during that time actually it was not anticipated that such kind of practices will finally also could be uh, could be responsible for creating uh, inefficiency or creating injustice in the society so that's why Woodrow Wilson 
while developing his argument in the science uh, study of administration, he talked about that a politicians, it is very difficult to expect from a politicians to uh, not to be biased towards his uh, own constitution, constituency, that the constituency who have voted for, the, for them. But while we are talking about the public administrators who need to come through the process of the merit, so automatically it is expected from them that they need to be neutral while implementing the law, while implementing the public policy. So for them, every citizen, every person is the citizen of the state and there is no logic to discriminate or uh, there is no logic to give preference to a particular group of citizen in comparison to others. So they are mandated to deliver all the citizen in an equal manner as for the mandate of the law. So with this actually an understanding have come up that there must be a separation. So while is um, observing the activities of administration that whether the administration continues to be conducted uh, in an effective manner without sticking to or without being influenced by the political process that could be taken as a ground of theoretical uh, generalization to study administration. So with this dichotomy as a theoretical generalization have come up uh, for the uh, study of administration and of course it has provided the um, uh, in enthusiasm to study public administration independently. So dichotomy as a paradigm, here we are talking about dichotomy uh, between the politics and administration. So the job of politics is different from the administration. So uh, the administration has a clear cut responsibilities to deliver the uh, law to the society, to deliver the program to the society. In that process, it needs to be neutral, in that process, it needs to be impersonal. In that process, it needs to stick to law so that it would be able to deliver the best. But as political process continues to interfere in the process of administration, therefore, administration is failing to achieving its true objective. So in that regard, dichotomy could be the uh, uh, base um, to study public administration independently. So the first phase essentially talked about that public administration would be studied as uh, an independent subject because it needs to act neutrally, which neutral from the political process. Okay. So this is all about the dichotomy paradigm and subsequently this uh, understanding uh, has been expanded through the writings of the James Goodnow who, um, 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 whose work on politics and uh, uh, policy talked about that how actually the politics actually uh, manipulates the politics actually creates the scope of manipulation in implementing the public policy uh, uh, by making pressure uh, pressure on administration. So if administration would be free from any kind of pressure, then automatically it would be able to achieve its desired end. So uh, with this actually public administration as a discipline um, begins its, its journey where uh, the in most of the universities in the uh, US that they have opened separate departments in order to study that uh, how far actually under what condition public administration could be immune from the political process. 
though initially uh, public administration was considered to be the part of political process, but subsequently realization have come up, actually it was the political process who is responsible for manipulating the intent of public administration to achieve its desired objective. So, so that's why public administration or those who are serving in public administration, they need to come through the merit-based recruitment system. And also they need to be guided by specific independent conduct rules so that they could be able to perform effectively, independently without uh, coming under the pressure of the politics. So, such kind of development actually provided uh, an independent theoretical base for public administration to be treated as a separate discipline from the political science. However, despite this theoretical base, the dichotomy as a uh, dichotomy uh, between the politics and administration as a theoretical base, still, till now, public administration particularly in the theorization, still confronting with that whether public administration really uh, been able to continue its journey uh, as, a, uh, as an independent discipline by sticking to the uh, values like neutrality, impersonality, legal-based uh, rational authority or not. So this question actually, uh, got subsequently problematized with the emergence of the new nation states, particularly after the Second World War. So after the Second World War, what happened when the, the states which have come up uh, and it was labeled as third world states. And so those third world states, that they, they are actually while bureaucracy was started to uh, work on. So uh, it created uh, another understanding that whether public administration uh, could really be an independent from the political process or uh, actually it is shaped through the political process or the social process. Okay. That's the broader way through which you would be able to understand the theoretical journey of public administration as a discipline. So we generally begin with dichotomy as a theoretical base. And under this dichotomy, we generally read about Woodrow Wilson, James Woodnow, and also of some extent, uh, Max Weber. Then, so then the second paradigm, which talked about the principles of public administration. The principles of public administration or the focus on principles of public administration generally begins with the two uh, uh, theoretical formulations. One is scientific management and another one is the administrative management. So administrative management elaborately talked about relying its uh, enter inquiry on the principles of public administration. Whereas scientific management talked about the issue of productivity in the organization. So at that time, if you consider the time framework from 1920s uh, onwards to the 1940s, uh, in both uh, American and European society has uh, had undergone the massive industrialization and at that time also that uh, they experienced the two wars so all these happenings actually led them to focus on their study on organization so no doubt the woodrow wilson's uh, uh, insight about the administration needs to be studied independently or administration uh, could be immune from the process of the politics so how that could be possible? So in that regard, that uh, the formation of the modern organization or the formation of the public bureaucracy has taken a very prominent role. So bureaucracy, which come as a form of organization in the expansion of industrial age, both in Europe and in the American society. So it was expected that the bureaucracy needs to act in a neutral manner and bureaucracy needs to solve 
the crisis of the society and they are the job of the academicians is to understand that whether the concerned bureaucracy or the bureaucratic offices are actually being guided by certain level of principles or not. So in that regard, we are studying Luther Bullock. We are also studying uh, the viewpoint of Henry Fayol. So who have elaborately talked about the principles of organization and uh, those thinkers asked us to uh, initiate uh, the, the studies on uh, organizations who are associated with public administration studies that they need to begin with uh, the principles of public administration. And uh, um, with this actually, uh, while we are going towards the case of scientific management, so what we are getting, the scientific management theory essentially the propounder, the Frederick Taylor's ideas, where we are getting that the organization could be run through one best principle, and that one best principle itself is the science of running that organization. And the organization, the purpose of the organization to achieve the productivity. So here, that if you read about the principles of public administration, you will get everything. Not only the purpose of the organization, you will also able to get uh, the understanding that how actually organization needs to be managed, like planning, budgeting, um, then uh, um, personnel, then the rules of operations like centralization, decentralization. But while you are reading about the public administration, you will get the understanding that the public administration organization needs to learn from the industrial organization because scientific management as a thought process has generated from an industrial organization. And government organ, there is a difference between government organization and industrial organization. So, but as the focus of administration was also to achieve the efficiency or also to achieve the efficiency in a cost effective way. So therefore, that the industrial organization, the lessons learned from the industrial organization has become the motivating factor for um, to uh, be accommodated as theoretical generalization in the public administration discipline. So, classic, so in textbook, generally, we are labeling both of them, the administrative management and the uh, scientific management as classical theories who are essentially supporting the um, paradigm, the first are two paradigms. That one is your politics and administration paradigm and the principles of public administration as a paradigm. So both of those theoretical frameworks have come up in, in order to sustain the both of the paradigm, the first two paradigms of the public administration. That one is that if uh, the scholars of public administration wanted to study uh, the subject independently, then they need to begin with the uh, principles of public administration. Then scientific management study suggests that, that if the uh, organization, uh, in case of organizational studies, we need to begin with understanding that how organization are really making profit under which principle they are actually been able to make profit in the concerned organization. So in that way, both of the theoretical framework, maybe administrative management or maybe scientific management, they are uh, focusing on uh, the classical objective of the public administration that efficiency and cost effectiveness efficiency economy effectiveness these are the purposes of the public administration so in that regard actually that both of the theoretical framework they talked elaborately about how to sustain efficiency and also how to 
sustain um, um, the uh, effectiveness uh, with uh, in a cost effective manner in the organization uh, could be a possibility but all those three theoretical sorry both of the theoretical framework though relying on the uh, have come up in support of the first two paradigms that is the dichotomy then the second one is the principles of public administration but uh, the interwar experience and subsequently after 1944 the emergence of the new nation states uh, um, uh, in the um, um, uh, in asia africa latin american countries that have that led to generate a, a new shift uh, that where uh, it provided the opportunities for the public administration scholars to engage with the debate that uh, no doubt the theoretical base like dichotomy and principles of public administration no doubt they are being created in uh, very much uh, at uh, united states of america and uh, they are very much specific to a particular geographical terrain so whether uh, in, uh, they could be validated okay whether they could be sustained in case of those new nation states so if we are saying that public administration could be a separate discipline from the political process and here this could be begin with that public administration need to be studied uh, in a neutral uh, manner so in that context uh, now the time has come to uh, uh, go for validation uh, and uh, those third world countries will provide the scope for validation that whether public administration in those states would be able to sustain uh, the philosophy of both the paradigms okay so with this actually we are observing uh, the crisis in the discipline of public administration so nicholas henry ha has elaborately mentioned about that how actually crisis has gained attention in the um, uh, discipline of public administration in uh, american society and what could be its implications in the third world state so with this actually the writings like most of the scholarly writings by uh, robert dhol then dwight waldo uh, have come up and uh, dwight waldo questioned the first two paradigm and he uh, pointed out that how could uh, the essence of public administration could be independent from the political process so uh, while we are saying that uh, public administration is about the government activity and public itself is a process of is a is a byproduct of the politics then in that process how could we say uh, that public administration could be studied in a very technical manner like uh, as prescribed by the, the principles uh, then if we take into account the Herbert Simon Herbert Simon's actually viewpoint considered to be uh, a very much uh, uh, critical provide, had provided a critical angle that principles are merely proverbs and those principles uh, essentially not uh, uh, could be taken as the final because every principle has its own counterpart. So in that context, that the real issues of public administration is not studying about merely organization. It is also studying about the human behavior in the organization. So, so uh, the classical theories of public administration, maybe in the which have appeared in the form of scientific management theory or administrative management theory, subsequently again uh, been questioned by all these scholars, maybe uh, Herbert Simon, then Dwight Waldo and Robert Dahl. So all three scholars, their uh, writings actually are provided a critical uh, angle that to renew 
uh, once again the uh, or today re-examine not renewed to uh, re-examine the question whether public administration as a discipline could be studied independently or not so with this actually the um, uh, uh, theoretical basis from the political science and of course from uh, the psychology behavioral science has got uh, entered uh, into the discipline of public administration so these are could be labeled as the modern uh, theories of public administration so all these modern theories of administration essentially taking us towards the human sides of the organization the values of democracy and of course the ethnocentric character of classical uh, theories of public administration okay so so robert dhal has exclusively questioned about the ethnocentric character of public administration there he is questioning while writing on the science of administration he is arguing that if we are saying that public administration need to be stu studied independently so definitely it must have a scientific base so is any scientific base definitely it must be a the a phenomenon of universality so if we are saying that public administration needs to be studied independently from the politics or public administration is an act which could be effectively uh, coming to its desired end without having an influence from the politics and public administration uh, um, uh, studies could be uh, enriched through studying principles then such kind of understanding must be validated through uh, conducting empirical exercise or empirical studies on public administration in the third world states so uh, as uh, such kind of uh, the previous understanding was uh, existing in case of uh, America. So that's why if those uh, understanding uh, have any kind of universality or the characteristics of universality, then it could be validated in case of those new states. So it has opened up new way to study public administration with the establishment of comparative administrative group. So comparative administrative group actually have come up with the intention to uh, observe the knowledge which, which had been generated in case of American society uh, or within the American society regarding public administration, whether that knowledge could be universally valid in case of the other societies also okay so with this a new direction have come up towards the theoretical inquiry of public administration then second direction have come up with the writings of the dwight waldo dwight waldo have elaborately while writing about the his work on administrative state he actually questioned that how could the public administration activities essentially immune from the political process because the administration needs to operate uh, in the state in a, in, a, in a democracy. So in a democracy, how could public administration could really be an independent from the political process? In democracy, while we are saying that it is to be ruled by the people, it is to be governed by the people, and here people are everything, and they need to influence the state. Then they, they are the uh, crucial agent to set the decision uh, or the policy making process of the state. So in that circumstances, how could public administration would be really independent from the political process? So he talked about the uh, the um, um, young universities uh, students movements uh, uh, at the American societies which uh, which uh, happened during that time and also talked about the municipal demand for municipal reform. So while any kind of demand is being generated from the societies in the form of movement, 
so in that regard whether public administration would be silent or not responding to the uh, uh, needs of that moments so in uh, by raising this issue he talked about <clears throat> that democracy in a democratic state it would be very difficult to determine that public administration is essentially immune from the process of politics so that has also leading towards creating a new strands of research in administrative theory which subsequently goes for uh, the new public administration as a uh, paradigm in the disciplinary inquiry then while going towards the herbert simons writing that he elaborately talked about the concern that rather than focusing on the principles of public administration there is a need to focus on uh, hello hello am i audible yes ma'am yes ma'am uh, so rather than focusing on the uh, question of the principles of public administration so uh, the focus of the scholar would be on how actually organizations are functioning uh, in terms of taking decisions so here uh, the person who are associated in the decision making process of uh, of the concerned organization their role needs to be studied and this could bring this could be able to establish uh the science in the public administration discipline uh, rather than focusing on the principles so he was herbert simon was very much critical about the principles of public administration and uh, he was uh, considering them as merely proverb proverbial in nature and because that each principles has its own counter principles so therefore he insisted that the scholarly inquiry or the any kind of theorization on public administration needs to shift from shift its attention from the principles to the uh, decision making aspect of the organizations that uh, how actually organizations are really doing how organizations are really taking decisions what are the constraints and challenges Uh, generally countered by the decision maker in the organization and what uh, in uh, makes a, um, a, an organization uh, to take uh, the best decision or uh, the moderate or uh, or you could say that uh, the worst decision so in that way he developed his theory of decision making and uh, for which uh, he has applied the principles of uh, psychology uh, the behavioral uh, tendencies of uh, studying the behavioral tendencies of the administrator and uh, provided a new directions particularly uh, to understand that how actually we need to understand an administrative man in comparison to an economic man so uh, this this so i told you about these are the three ways through which actually the previous two paradigms which continues to uh, dominate the disciplinary inquiry of public administration in the shape of scientific management and administrative management uh, subsequently led towards the development of other theories so one of the theories have come up in the shape of the behavioral theory particularly with the decision making theory by herbert simon then subsequently the uh, uh, it was elton mao whose experiment with uh, the informal organization that organization essentially the creation of social entity that have come up then and uh, subsequently the new public administration as a paradigm has also come up so with this actually we are getting uh, that uh, whether public administration to be taken as a management science or whether public administration to be taken as a political science 
or whether public administration could be taken as merely as public administration. So here we are getting the another three paradigms as per the uh, prescription by Nicholas Henry. Okay, so Nicholas Henry, if uh, you please uh, download this article from the Google Scholar, that Nicholas Henry finally ended with the argument that public administration uh, till could be studied as public administration because of the emergence of good governance paradigm. So good governance paradigm, no doubt, have tried to accumulate the new institutionalism, the values of new institutionalism, neoliberal theory, but at the same time, the concern for good governance once again sticking to achieving that how public administration is doing uh, its act towards uh, uh, delivering the services, delivering uh, the programs, delivering or enforcing the law regulations in the society. So in that regard, the job of public administration has becoming more important day by day. And in no doubt, political process still trying to intersect with the public administration and also social process is trying to intersect with the so public administration. But despite that, public administration somehow able to retain its independent image uh, of course, so far as Western uh, American dimension is concerned, still it continues to predominate in the theoretical general, generalization of uh, public administration. So with this I am ending. So tomorrow we'll begin with the elaborative discussion with the scientific management theory and administrative management theory. Any questions? Hello. Are you all there? Hello. Ma'am, uh, can ma'am can you please repeat uh, what you will uh, teach us uh, uh, tomorrow? No, I'll tomorrow I'll focus elaborately about the scientific management and administrative management theory. Today I just told you the framework how actually administrative theory needs to be studied. Okay, so in that regard, I extensively touched upon. Uh, the article written by Nicholas Henry. So I don't know whether in your material the article by Nicholas Henry is referred or not. Uh, definitely it must be referred. But if it is not there, you please download it from the Google Scholar and read it. Then you could be able to understand the framework that the context through which administrative theory has been discussed elaborately. Okay, so scientific management theory and administrative management theory, they are basically referred as classical theories in public administration. Okay, so these classical theories has been supported with uh, the first two paradigms. I, mean, I have mentioned na, the dichotomy and subsequently principles of public administration. So uh, what are their actually the core argument? we'll discuss elaborately in tomorrow's class okay 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 then if you don't have any question i have ended so so once again tomorrow we'll meet okay thank you ma'am okay bye thank you ma'am mm -hmm.